From the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and concerned citizens making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Melithopoulos, Assistant Professor in Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. It's true. Sometimes I look over the fence at the ornithologist and I'm a little bit envious. I mean, birds are fascinating. Their diversity is remarkable. They have strange and kooky habits. And in addition, there's this huge um, group of birders that are committed to generating data on the occurrence and behavior of birds. I kind of hope one day that, you know, the study of insect pollinators will somehow reach this level that birding is at. And I was excited to learn about a project out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that is looking to help out to take that vast amount of bird data and use it as a bio indicator, potentially, of where pollinating insects are located and what they're doing. I had the good opportunity to talk to Dr. Jose Rousseau this week about this project. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and she's going to tell us a little bit about um, the the, uh, where this project is at and some of the methodologies they're using and how this data could be used. And at the end of the episode, she gives us these wonderful insight on some of the hummingbirds of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'm always squeamish that we don't have a good episode on hummingbirds, but one will be coming soon. But also a quick announcement, March 5th uh, is the 8th Annual Bevent Pollinator Conference, the largest pollinator conference uh, um, in the Pacific Northwest region. It's a great place to learn about how you can do gardening or small farming to help pollinators. And this uh, here, I have it on good authority. Keynote speaker is going to be Olivia Messenger Carroll from the Bees in Your Backyard. You don't want to miss this. It's only $30. Early registration is recommended. I'm going to put the link to Bevent in the show notes. And without further ado, let's go to Jose Rousseau to hear about the birds and the bees this week on Pollination. Welcome to Pollination. Thank you. Well, it's really great to have you here. You know, one of the, one of the kind of um, things that I'm most embarrassed about on this show is we've had almost 200 episodes and we've never had somebody who has worked with birds. And it's like birds are important pollinators, but. This is an honor. And you have birds that are pollinators. I know. <laughs> I actually can say I've got a flowering a quince that's just starting to flower outside and I've got a whole bunch of um, hummingbirds that are perched there. And, you know, yes, the Anna's hummingbirds are around and they're very vocal. (laughs) Well, I guess let's make that transition today. So I guess the the thing that I'm, you know, really one thing I remember in a past episode, we had John, Dr. John Asher on from the. um, who works on the World Bee Project out in Singapore. And he made this, he said that, you know, insect pollinator biodiversity today is just sort of coming into its own. It's almost, he said this, it's almost at a place where bird ornithology was in the 1970s. And my sense, it, when, it, when he said that, I thought, oh, there's just been, since the 70s, there's been a lot. And if we just fast forward to today, there's a lot of ways in which data occurrence data for birds is accumulated can you just give us a picture of like uh give us a little look at the bird world on how people know where birds are and uh survey work and sure. all that um there's definitely a lot of ways to study the biodiversity and learn about the birds where they are um what they do um we have database um the one i'm working with is actually ebird which covers the entire world um it's data around the year, like, you know, any month of the year. And it's um, citizen scientists that um, look at their feeders and and enter the data. And this is being used by people like me, scientists like me, that wants to look at patterns across, you know, in my case, North America. But we also have other um, sets of data sets, like uh, the breeding bird surveys, which are more focused on the breeding birds. So during the summer, uh-huh. but this is a standardized protocol that has been running since 1966. Um, and this is across the U S and Canada. 
And then we have others um, like um, some bird bending data. If people want to learn about age and sex of the birds, um, you know, how many babies they produce every year. Um, so those are different data sets that kind of focus on different time of the year, different aspect of the birds. But uh, depending on the research question, they are available and have been available for many years. You know, just thinking about uh, you know, just uh, get, narrowing in on just bee occurrence data, not butterflies and other uh, insects. It, what's remarkable about that is with birds, it's not just where the bird was sighted, but many aspects of its life history are recorded. So you have, you know, not just we know the range of this bird is here. We know the reproductive success may be going up or down or all of that, I guess, is now captured. It's much richer. Depending on the data sets, we know where they're breeding, where they're not breeding. Uh, we know how many of them are where. And if um, um, they're very abundant at certain time of the year versus other time of the year, because birds, you know, move around quite a bit. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. Well, so this is great. So this is, this is, you know, it, 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 part of this is like, this is perhaps what, you know, people in the bee world would aspire to in the future. Um, but you've sort of taken an interesting tact here in your research at Cornell university. Um, and I guess one of the you know key aspects of this is, you know, perhaps leveraging this rich bird, uh, data set to understand, uh, insect pollinators and insect biodiversity. Why do you expect there to be any kind of correspondence between bird and uh, insect biodiversity? Well, there's, I would say, two main reasons that I see that are like most obvious. Um, and we're focusing on one of them. I'll start with the other one. Okay. The one most people would think of is that birds are eating insects. Oh, right. They're insectivore. <laughs> and so... They should be, um, you know, the two should be correlated, insect population, bird population. Uh -huh. And in many cases, they are. But when we focus a little bit more on bees, for example, there is not a lot of birds that are actually specializing on bees. That relationship is not as strong. I know of, for example, the summer tanager, which has evolved to like focus on bees and wasps, but that's more of an exception than anything. So if we think all pollinators, yes, birds eat insects, mm -hmm. but if we focus on bees, the relationship is not as direct. So the approach we're taking is that birds and bees and any pollinators really are likely affected by things that are common to both of them. They are both reliant on their environment. And so whatever is present in that environment is likely affecting both of them. So, for example, intensity of land use, um, the use of pesticides, the uh, presence of certain habitat types, which both bees and birds may be reliant on. And so if um, landscape attributes, specific landscape attributes are there, it could actually affect bee communities and birds in similar ways. Okay, that makes sense. So you would expect, for example, where you might have a kind of a very intact plant community, uh, there'd be a lot of, you know, a lot of bird, there'd be a lot of niches, a lot of birds, and the same thing, you know, reasonable to assume that that might be the case also for pollinating insects. Yes. So if we, for example, we have a lot of birds that um, focuses on open landscapes, and they will uh, maybe rely on some forested area close to um, agriculture or pastures. And we have lots of bees that are like that, too. They like edges of forest sometimes because it's undisturbed, because there's more nesting habitats. But they like also the openness where there's like all the flowers growing. And so maybe we have birds that are also affected by the same landscapes. Oh, fascinating. I never thought about that. But bird, uh, many there must be a whole host of birds that share very similar habitat types as well. Exactly. And that's one of our interests. Can we look at data on birds and look at data on bees and see if whenever we have a high richness, a high number of species of bees, is there some bird species that are actually typically present that Whenever we cannot figure out the richness of bees, if we see that bird, we can kind of assume that if that bird is present, maybe we can have a high richness of, of bees. Do you oh, understand what I mean? I do. So it's unlike the first, uh, the first approach that people take, that there's some kind of functional interrelationship that 
birds eating. It's the, less direct. But it, it's more looking at there might be some life history overlaps and that some allows, requirements for their life history yeah. exactly that are similar between some of the bird species and many of the birds uh, of the bee species. Okay, I get I get it. So tell me tell me a um a little bit about your approach. How how do you do this? Like uh, imagine you know gathering did you got this rich I mean one of the things that immediately comes to mind is you've got this really rich bird data set but then you've got this insect pollinator data set that's museum collections spotty here or there somebody yes which actually is the reason we started this project we are aware that pollinators are decreasing and that the data are not as abundant as for bird data and so part of the question is okay at those places where we have good amount of bee data and good amount of bird data what's the relationship so that all those places where there's less bee data but we have bird data, then we can, you know, see if that, um, if we can help the, the pollinator indirectly by assessing what birds are there. Because okay. birds are a little bit easier to, um, um, to monitor as well. Okay. So you are, I imagine this involves combing through databases and databases. Yes. <laughs> 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 Trying to find these sweet spots where you've got you know, this correspondence so that you can make predictions outward. Um, tell us Correct. a little bit about how you, you know, tell us a little bit about this process of um, database sleuthing. <laughs> yes. So this was um, a process, like you said. The first thing we looked at is what data are publicly available. And, and there's like a few sources, quite a few sources. But we wanted as much as possible data that span across the U.S., which was a little bit more difficult. So we had things like um, iNaturalist, like uh, GBIF, which is Global Biodiversity. Oh, I wish I remembered all letter. Yeah. Um, but a lot of data goes into GBIF. And then there was um, SCAN, which is more focused on insects. And scan, it's, I think it's scan-bugs.com.org. Mm, I should look into well, it. We will put but, it in um, the show notes, but uh, th this is the you. most interesting thing because you and I were sitting by a microscope one day and you, you said, you ever heard, hear of this? I said, no, I never heard of this. And it's really remarkable. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes. So a lot of different organization, uh, government, nonprofit, museum, uh, from across the world, uh, maybe more in North America, but really there's from across the world, have uploaded their data and it's publicly available and it's free. And so there's, um, I would think, millions of records. I personally focus on data that's somewhat recent. So I was able to download about 1 million records or so of different pollinators, you know, butterfly and bees and wasp and all of that. And then I scanned down a little bit more to the bees. But this is a really rich source of data that um, anybody could use, really. Okay, so you, you've you got all sorts of d uh, data. How do you do, you do any, um, is there any steps for kind of selecting which, you talked about date as being one of the things you don't want yeah. to know the world in the early 1900s you want to know about it now so what else, what how else do you kind of uh, select the data yeah so the, the first one like you said is the date most of our ebird data which i'm using are like i would say since 2010 to 2000 um, to, to now and so i wanted to use b data that were a little bit more recent so as well since 2010 um one of the things that um was a major limiting factor, to be honest with you, in terms of the B data, is I needed to be able to compare different places. And it's hard to compare places when you don't know how much surveying, how much effort each of those places have had. And so let's say we have uh, a place in um, two different places, let's say in New York, and, and one of them has had one survey of, let's say, three hours, and the other one has had 10 surveys. <clears throat> 10 surveys. If I don't know that one has had one survey and the other one 10, I cannot compare the richness of these. You, you just in the see two. in the right, you just see a record of an occurrence and you may yes. see a lot of them at one place and a lot, but they've been sampling way more and it may, stands to reason you sample more, you find more. You find more bee species probably when you sample more. Yeah. And so I needed to standardize the surveys by effort. I needed to know how, many, how much effort, how much monitoring had been done at different places so that if I had more bee species, I knew 
if it was because there was more bee species or because there was more surveys that was done there. I needed to break those two reasons apart. How do you do that? And having, mm-hmm, go ahead. How do you do that? That sounds like a tricky, without any records, nobody leaves a little note for you telling you what they did. How do you, how do you yeah. do that? I had to actually filter the data sets for those that had effort. Okay. Which was okay. the sad part. I had to ignore um, thousands and thousands of record, but the ones that I have that does have, you know, number of pan traps, number of net hours, those are extremely high quality. And these data I could use actually to really assess the bee richness and compare different locations. Okay. Fantastic. All right. But I did cut you off in mid sentence as I was asking that question. Let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> So, so once I have um, a bee richness at different places yeah. and, and it's been standardized by the number of traps or by the number of nets, and I have the same thing with the birds. For the birds, we have that we, um, you know, listen to the birds and surveyed for 10 minutes. So I can really standardize the birds to know what species are where and in what abundance. And I can do the same thing. Uh, to a certain level with the bee data. So now I have a better idea that if there's a location with lots of bee, I can really see, okay, what birds are there or what birds are absent when there's lots of bees. It could, you know, play both ways. And and I can look at different locations um, across the U.S. to see if there's a pattern that comes up. I, and Jess, I, I want to take a quick break before we get into your results, but how many locations did you end up uh, uh, have you ended up kind of pulling out? Uh, what are we looking at? And what kind of dist- mm-hmm. is it coast to coast or? So because the bee species and the bird species changes quite a bit across area, I decided at least for now to focus a little bit on the East Coast because that's where there's the most um, standardized bee data. And so most of of this at least first step is focusing on Eastern bees and Eastern birds. Um, and I um, categorize the location in like little cells of like one kilometer radius. So these little area, I have um, over a hundreds of them, maybe 150. I need to double check. Oh, so but, it's a fairly, um, not- fairly large um, as, a, as a sort of proof of concept. You've got a nice large amount of locations. Yes, I do. I, I wish I had more, but yes, that's <laughs> way better than nothing. Yes. And so this is this is what we're using at this point. We are at the point of um, um, developing the methodology because not a lot of people have done exactly what we're trying to do. Um, and, and we still need to validate our, our results. No, no, that's that's good. Well, uh, let's take let's just take a break. I think I want to hear more about um sort of the data, the, the broad trends, I know this is preliminary data, but also how the data will be validated and how this will be turned into a useful tool. So let's just take a quick break. We'll be back in a second uh, with uh, Dr. Jose Rousseau. And now we're back. <laughs> So, okay, it was a very short break, folks, but um, uh, uh, we've been having this conversation. I've been talk- kind of talking with you. It's really a delight because uh, in addition to sort of sifting through data, you've actually you know, made your own bee collection. You're, you're a master melatologist apprentice and you've been, you know, we, we meet down in the, uh, at the microscope sessions. I'm working through my bees and you're working through your bees. <laughs> you know, this has been such a fun process. I have um, studied birds for years now, and and bees is all new to me. So I felt that I needed to learn about how to identify them. What's their ecology? Where do they live? What do they do? And the um, participating in the Oregon Bee Atlas has been like eye opening. I I did a yard list, which I love. I have help with like identifying the bees and I have so much fun. Like people that look at cute cat pictures. Now look at bees <laughs> under a microscope. This is so much cuter. <laughs> well, I'm glad you've had that experience, but yeah. <laughs> For me, I love it. Yeah. It's always great. You kind of, especially with the microscope, you look at, you look at them, uh, you get to see these strange features and, you know, Lincoln pops up and he's like, Oh, look at that. And it's like, Oh, 
I, I do feel bees are way underappreciated. Um, <laughs> we need to get the word out there. Like birds are cute. I, I, I love birds. Don't get me wrong. But um, <laughs> more people need to, to learn about bees. Well, I think this is a, I, I love your project because it really does bridge these two areas. And I, I also just love it because there, you know, there are a, a real dedicated group of people generating the bird data. And, you know, the hope, at least here in Oregon, is, you know, we'll chip away at that a little bit and have you know, something maybe a little bit more modest, but akin to that. And I guess uh, just coming back around to your work. So you are in the first stages. You've just, uh, you probably just assembled this database. You've got your locations, you've got your little grids popped up. And I'm just wondering, are you, uh, you know, how's, how's it looking so far? And I know you're really in early days of looking at the data, but is it, is, you know, this broader question, is there any correspondence between bees and birds? Yeah, so I do have a data set for the bees, a data set for the birds, and I've been able to look at a um, link between the two. And I'm starting to see a pattern, which is really, really interesting. So our next step will be to, one, validate the results. But what we're also very interested in is that these bird species that we hope will, will be confirmed um, What's their landscape? What's their habitat? And what's the habitat of the bees that are associated with those birds? So that whenever we pinpoint that landscape feature, we know that that landscape feature is associated with high richness of bees and the specific bird species as well. And I'm, I imagine, I want, so um, I imagine in the future, it, like if this works out, then it can really supplement uh, native bee work, it may be, it would, it can indicate where is a good site. I, you know, I was just on a meeting earlier today, about how do you prioritize sites for native bee sampling? And it, I can imagine something like this might give you some information as to where those biodiverse hotspots are. And then, you know, and you might just go in and focus your effort there, but how do you see this being applied uh, beyond just that? I imagine there's a lot of different applications if this turns out to be true. Yeah, no, you do bring a good point. That that's that's definitely one of them. Another one would be to um, when we think of pollinators, they're very important in food production. And so, if we can help um, producer uh, guide them and say, okay, these habitat features are very important for high richness of bees. Um, we're hoping we can maybe go in that direction also and provide some um, um, habitat management guidance that would help. Um, the bees specifically in, in agricultural landscapes. I also really like this approach because, you know, when you talk to anybody doing restoration work, if you in, talk to NRCS, you know, uh, federal agencies that are tasked with conservation, they will often have multiple objectives. It would be really great if at the same time as you're, you know, allocating resources for bee, bee and pollinator restoration, you're also helping bird populations or vice versa. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that the two are, are, are linked for sure, but really our goal is, is to see what's the, you know, can the bird be an indicator of, of bee communities and can we help the bee pollinator population, um, you know, go back up a little bit with the data, the huge amount of data we have on birds. Um, so it might, it probably will help the birds too, but really we're hoping to help the pollinators at this point. Last question I have is you talked about uh, um, validation steps. How will you validate this model? How will we know, you know, I guess you're, you have these study sites, um, but you know, that the intent is to be able to make predictions beyond the study sites. Tell us a little bit about that process. So, so part of this process will be to look at um, comparing the bird species between regions across different period of times and see if the patterns still hold. And then being able um, maybe to do predictions in places and seeing if the bee richness in those places where we have um, X, Y, Z bird species um, still hold. So it will be like, you know, looking in new area, but also for the data we have comparing different time, uh, different uh, time period, different look uh, regions. Um, and, I'm sure there's other ways. I, I yeah. Yeah. Can you, <laughs> More work can, can, you, you do. can you explain that first one? I didn't quite get that. So the second part, I understand, you, you know, you, you might find some, you already have bird data where you don't have bee data and you go there and you just check, are there, or, you know, there's, you just check, is there a lot of bees or not a lot of bees? Are they abundant or diverse? But the second one that you mentioned, 
no, I guess there was the first one that you mentioned looking at the seasonality in different regions. Yes. Can you explain well, that to me. Seasonality may be um, a little less, but like um, in terms of years, for example, if we have, we establish a pattern for the years 2000 to 2015, does that pattern hold 2015 to 2020? And so that's a way of validating is, is this pattern for some years still valid for the next set of years? And so uh, we can look at the, um, you know, the bee and the birds 2015 and the ones in 2010, for example, and see, is the same pattern coming up? I see because it may be because obviously bird and bee populations are constant fluctuating. And if they fluctuate at the same in synchrony, then it really is even more powerful. Mm -hmm. So we limited our um, analysis to specific small block, you know, of three, four or five years, because habitat may change, the climate may change. And so really our, when we look at at the bees and when we look at the birds, we did that within a very focused time frame. And and so if we, we want to be able to see if that um, link is still holds later on or earlier on. Amazing work. Well, we'll have you back uh, as as the results uh, develop and as you start to do some of that validation work. But let's take another quick break. We're going to come back. We have a segment that we do with our guests uh, where you tell us a little bit about your book and tool and favorite pollinator species. Okay, we are back with a longer break this time. (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. okay so we've got three uh, and you've already warned me i said book recommendation you said uh i think it's gonna be an app so uh all right uh we're gonna now bend the rules here what are your app, app recommendations <laughs> i have two app recommendations that i rely on every time i go outside one of them is ebird of course So you've heard is a citizen science and folks, anybody, my grandparents, myself, my son, they, everybody can actually upload what bird they observe where. And don't worry if you, um, you know, don't know all your birds, you can do what you, you feel like doing and, and people at the other end will, will, you know, accommodate and, and filter the data. But this is an app that's really useful to me. The other one, which actually even more people might like is Merlin. M-E-R-L-I-N. Both of them are free apps. Merlin is what helps me identify the birds. So you can identify visually, you can identify uh, through photo, you can identify by song. And Merlin is helping me quite a bit with that. Okay. I'm really curious about these apps because they seem to be, you know, I, we, I think in the pollinator world, we have a lot to learn from the structure of them. So eBird, for example, um, does it is it just like iNaturalist? You you capture a picture and you just load it up, or is it more? Are there more fields that you can fill in? Tell us a little bit about uh, an entry in eBird. Yes, an entry to the the minimum. An entry is going to be a species at a place and their abundance and at a time. And so your GPS knows where you are, your phone knows the date. So that's being kind of added somewhat automatically. And then you add the species and how many of them you detected. And then if you want, which we like is you can add how long you were counting birds for or how long you walked. Um, Those are things you you can have in there. There is definitely um, more fields than an iNaturalist. You don't have to take a photo. Taking photos of birds is really, really hard. Um, but you can actually add if the birds were singing, what behavior, um, was it a male or female? There's a lot of sub details that you could if you want to add. Um, the good thing about eBird is that it keeps track of your observation. It's not only used by scientists at the other end, but for you yourself, you have an account and it keeps track of what you've seen, where and how many species you've seen in the county, in the state, in the country. So it, it keeps track of your of, of your Bird of list. your walks. Your, yeah, of your list for you. I, I love my list. I'll have to tell you uh, uh, for bees. But so okay, so um, but it has these fields for effort, which I guess is one of the things mm-hmm. that almost every, you know, what automated way of recording a pollinator digitally does not 
really have a field for. So there, it, there is an option there where you can say, I, oh, I was out for about 30 minutes, roughly. And actually, yeah, you can, you don't even have to tell them that it was 30 minutes. You press, you know, you start your walk in the forest, you press start. Yeah. And your phone's going to calculate how long you've been adding birds for and how far you've been walking. And so often this is actually done by default because you have the GPS in your phone uh, and you start your list at the man, beginning do we when you start counting and then you stop. That would be so great because uh, uh, just descending into our world of the Oregon Bee Atlas, you, you know, you record all the plants that you saw. But you have no idea how long you were out there. It would be really nice if you if you had some way of saying, I'm I'm at the site, I'm starting. Yes. And this is how much time I spent out here. But without that having to be, record it. That would make a huge difference. All right. Okay. Good. An idea <laughs> was sorry, this is a good bird thing. Hatched here today. <laughs> Excellent. Uh -huh, okay. I guess I guess, you know, I guess uh insects don't exactly hatch they kind of dissolve through their corian but it's less dramatic <laughs> <laughs> it's okay we um do they no they don't fledge either they don't fledge no <laughs> these are okay all right so uh merlin as well uh, we'll put these in the show notes and so a great way to identify your birds uh and i like yes. the idea of the bird song uh, i'm always hearing these birds that's what same. makes um identifying birds so much easier is they're so vocal they're so i don't want to say loud but like each bird has their song and calls and and you know i'm working on it but some people are so good at just walking somewhere and they know every little call what species it is they, they don't have sub antennal sutures <laughs> 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 you're very right they don't bring their microscope in the field <laughs> okay all right well that's great those are really great app recommendations and so i wonder what your go-to tool is uh, for the kind of work that you do i work in front of a computer all day long and the the the, the program i use is called r which you probably um heard of um I, I do everything in R. It has been I, recommended in the past. Not yeah, often. I, I format the data. I compare the data. I summarize the data. I, I do spatial analysis, statistical analysis. Um, I plot my results, um, map my results. Everything is done in R. And I guess that, uh, you know, people are wondering, how can you have such a Swiss army knife of, you know, in one software? And I guess it has the, it's it has this remarkable way that people write these packages. It is an open source program. And so um, people can write packages about a lot of different subject, a lot of different tools are, have been written. And those package, um, you know, they're a double check to make sure they, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But um, for the most part, there's, I don't know how many packages in R, but I would probably say many, many hundreds, if not thousands. Well, I imagine we know all the ecological ones, but I'm sure there's the business R suite things. And there's the people who do financial, like there must be weird, strange R packages. And it opens the question for your, just to get really nerdy. What are the R packages that you find indispensable? I, I have a soft spot for map view. And MapView is when I have my data and I want to see where they are, but in a, um, what's the word? I can click on it and it's going to pop up a little box of what that record is. And I can zoom in and zoom out, see different extent. I really like uh, MapView. I don't but then know. I have it sounds others. amazing. Hmm? I, I don't know it, but it sounds amazing. Yeah, it's really it's really useful. And then I have others that just allows me to write functions in a way that's very simple. So... I have a range of packages. Well, you know, for people who are in the Oregon Bee Atlas, you know, they get this report that has all these nice graphs and it shows where your specimens were collected and it kind of compares your what you identified versus. Other, and that's all done in R. So we have a programmer, yeah. Sam Robinson, who who uh, pulls that all together. And um, it, it's a powerful program. A good, good tool. Yeah, I, it is indispensable. Okay. It's essential to my work anyway. Well, the, la the last qu uh, the last question we have is, uh, uh, do you have a pollinator uh, species that you uh, consider your favorite? Well, 
to stick with the birds a little bit, I would say I love the Rufus hummingbird. It's one of my favorite um, pollinator. Um, and in terms of the bees, I I don't even know. I think they're all cool. But I would say bees as a generic thing, I love them. And then in terms of birds, the Rufus hummingbirds is my favorite one. Well, since we've got finally have a bird person on here. So we've got uh, we have two resident hummingbirds in the winter in Oregon. Is that right? At least in West. We Oregon. have mainly one, the Anna's hummingbird. The Rufus is going to arrive around March, April and stay until about uh, July. And then uh, I always wonder about this. I, you know, I was out uh, up in high elevation and, you know, it was drying up in the valley. And I wondered, do hummingbirds in the summer migrate upwards? Because I imagine things get so dry, there's not a lot of flowering plants left. That is a very good observation. So the hummingbird, the Rufus hummingbird is going to migrate north um, in the spring, like, you know, March, April, using a coastal route, which is not as high elevation, but is more likely to have a lot of flowers, for example. Ah. And then when they migrate south, they have a tendency of using higher elevation where it's it's a little bit more wet. And that's where all the flowers are in July, August, as they're migrating south through, you know, the Sierra and the Rockies. And so they do use slightly different habitats for each of their migration. And they, of course, stay here all, you know, all summer until like, you know, July, August. But um, yeah. So let me get this straight. They, they migrate up the coast because, you know, there's a night right now there's flowers on the coast uh, and then they may they come in by the coast it includes the coastal range the coastal range but then they start yeah. to move inland and then as the summer progresses they they start to move to higher elevation for um to follow the flowers so they're gonna breed somewhat like you know um yes it's somewhat closer to the to the coast like it, they breed in oregon up to alaska uh -huh. and then as they're migrating getting ready to migrate south they're gonna go, go a little bit inland and then they're gonna start going south man we need a hummingbird show <laughs> hummingbirds are really cool but you know I, I, yeah bees as well well thank you for uh, uh giving us the crossover uh show today this is uh tempt our appetite for making a full pl uh, plunge into the birds in a future episode and we are looking forward to having you back in the future to find out how your research is uh, faring i'm looking forward to share my results with you guys and and uh, uh this was pleasant this was very nice and um, thank you very much andoni Thank you so much for listening. The show is produced by Quinn Sin and Neil, who's a student here at OSU in the New Media Communications Program. And the show wouldn't even be possible without the support of the Oregon Legislature, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and Western SER. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on the website, which is at pollinationpodcast.oregonstate.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's several ways to connect with me. The first one is you can visit the website and leave an episode-specific comment. You can suggest a future guest or topic or ask a question that could be featured in a future episode. But you can do the same things on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by visiting the Oregon Bee Project. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.